And clearly one issue of creating monopolies is monopolies exercise monopoly power. So, you know, if you think about Amazon, Amazon, you know, it's squeezing its suppliers, it's squeezing its workforce. Uh, if we think about Facebook and some of the other aggregators, we think, oh, they're not monopolies, they're not, you know, they're not um, abusing their power because we don't pay for those sites, but they are. They're just doing it in different ways. And if we think about Uber, there's, in fact, there's a brilliant podcast, if you have time to listen to it, uh, by Freakonomics, and they look at the demand curve for Uber and how, uh, how, how they've, how Google, have, sorry, how, how Uber has essentially moved uh, can, welfare away from its drivers towards them, they've extracted some of that rent, and towards us as consumers. So because we benefit as consumers, we sometimes forget that, that other people in the value chain are getting squeezed. So, so one issue with aggregators is that they exercise, they become monopolies and they exercise monopoly power. The other issue is that rather than help us to, to manage the, uh, the abundance of information and help us to, uh, to, uh, to get a higher return on our attention, they're actually stealing our attention, right? So every time you get, a, you know, you get an alert to say you've been tagged in a photo, every time you get an alert to say somebody's retweeted your tweet, they are hijacking your attention, right? They're taking you to that site, and then you're probably going to spend an hour on that site before you've even realized, uh, re realized it. This here is an example of YouTube. YouTube starts the next video straight after the last one you watched. They don't want you to leave those sites. Every time you go onto a site, they present you with their menu, their timeline, not your timeline. So rather than help us with our attention, they're stealing our attention. And they're stealing our attention and they're serving us up fake news, right? So they're, they're not taking any responsibility for the content on their site. They're serving us up fake news. And they're creating filter bubbles. So this is, um, this is a Wall Street Journal uh, site. It's called, I think it's called Blue and Red uh, Facebook. So you can go on there any time you want and you can search uh, for, any, uh, for many different topics and you can see what, what's, what conservatives are saying and what liberals are saying on social media. And they're completely different. As we found out, if you, know, if you lived in the UK, during the Brexit vote, I, I don't know a single person who voted to leave the European Union. And um, so it's just we are living in, in two different worlds, two different communities uh, because of filter bubbles. So I think, so this I'm going to make a prediction, which is I think we're going to see these advertising-based aggregation models being challenged. And they're going to be challenged because of regulation, uh, things like GDPR, uh, which are giving us more control over our data, they're going to be challenged, I think, because ad tech has been oversold. So I read the other day that Procter & Gamble cut their ad tech budget by a billion dollars and saw absolutely no impact whatsoever. I think, so I think ad tech is overhyped and oversold. And I think the other reason is that as consumers, you know, we're starting to appreciate that our, we are overloaded and we actually need aggregators who will help us to make better decisions. They'll help us to get a higher return on our finite attention. And it's into this, oh sorry, and, this, and I actually think you're starting to see this play out, right? So this is data from Y Combinator. Um, and it's data from all of the applications they get to join, join the program. And you can already see that, that subscription-based business models are starting to overtake advertising-based uh, business models. So I think you're already starting to see this play out. And it's, and it's into this space that I think banks can play, right? Because um, banks can do the role of aggregation. Um, they can take all of our different data sets, our contextual data, our locational data, our financial data, which they already have, and they can marry that with all of the other data that they collect, market data, risk data, and so on. And I think they're in a position to, to really help us, right? To, to make better financial and commercial decisions, right? Whether that's saving for a car, whether it's whether it's planning and putting aside enough money for retirement, whether it's managing a massive portfolio of investments. I think banks really are in a position to act as an aggregator and one that acts in the interest of its customers. And to, and to talk about what externalities that might bring, right? So if, if they do pull all that information, they can reduce transaction costs. They can reduce transaction costs because we don't have to shop around. If they introduce us to products and services that we actually need and that would, would, um, would improve our financial welfare, then, then 
that could reduce transaction costs, which would increase the provision of financial services. And don't forget, there, there are, there's more than a billion people in the world that don't have access to financial services. Uh, reducing adverse selection. So um, why can't businesses get credit? Why can't individuals sometimes get credit? Many times it's because there isn't enough information, right? Banks don't want to take the risk because they, there's no credit data. Banks don't want to take the risk because they don't know the financial performance of that business. More data in those situations can lead to, to, to less adverse selection and better outcomes. And then, you know, if, if we're pushing more money to business, if we are helping people get access to financial services for the first time, if we're giving loans to people who need them to create businesses, then we will see positive externalities. Okay. Um, just very quickly, um, if banks do take this role, they clearly need to make sure that they don't become the next Facebook, right? So they, they need to take care not to turn all the consumer surplus into producer surplus. So what I mean by that is they can't charge us, use our information to charge every single person a different price for the same uh, service. They will need to do much more vetting of their own sites, right? You know, we're, if, we have a, if we get shipped a book and the book is damaged, Sure, we can leave a bad rec we can leave a bad rating. That's not going to work in financial services. You know, it's not going to work when we're talking about mortgages, uh, when we're talking about uh, financial advice. So they would have to do a lot more vetting. And then one other, just to leave one final thought about data, which is there's a lot of bias in the data sets that people use to train algorithms. And so I think banks will be, need to be careful to avoid bias in the data and bias being transferred from bankers who then train algorithms. So, but anyway, just to leave you with a, a final thought, um, there is a big gap for, uh, for banks here. Banks, um, it's, banks can step into our lives and they can help us to make better financial and commercial decisions. And they, there is a way forward to be a much better aggregator than the ones we have, the ones we work with today. So, thanks. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Ben.